Hi, good afternoon. This is uh, uh, the eighth uh, EUSOMI webinar. Uh, my name is Emanuele Neneri, I'm the president of the society, and I would like to welcome uh, Professor Siegel, uh, which is the today speaker. Uh, Professor Siegel is professor and vice chair at the University of Maryland and chief of imaging for the VA Maryland healthcare system, and a joint professor of computer science and of biomedical engineering at the University of Maryland undergrad campuses. He worked closely with the Watson Jeopardy team to help educate the Dr. Watson software in the field of medicine. His area of interest and responsibility at both the local and national levels include digital imaging and PECs, telemedicine, the electronic medical record, and informatics and artificial intelligence in medicine. Dr. Siegel has won numerous teaching awards at the University of Maryland, including a medical school mentor of the year. He has been named as overall radiology researcher of the year by his peers and separately as educator of the year. Professor Siegel has also been selected by the editorial board of medical imaging as one of the top radiology in the United States on multiple occasions. Professor Siegel will uh, talk today about a very hot topic. We'll talk about using imaging informatics for personalized clinical decision support. Professor Siegel, you are welcome to the eighth Eusomi webinars, please. Oh, uh, thank you. And I'm really honored to, uh, to be invited to participate in um, what I can see has been really an excellent series. Um, I also wanted to thank everybody for, for attending. I know it's uh, six o'clock in the evening, uh, your time, and I'm sure. This is really um, very much appreciated by me um, for you um, spending the time to, uh, to um, listen in and participate. And um, for me, I, I'd like to share a little bit of um, my experience with imaging informatics for personalized clinical decision support. But I'm really looking forward at the end of the talk about hearing some of your questions and, and ideas and thoughts and any of your experience also. And, and that will certainly make it uh, fun for me too. <clears throat> so thanks again, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I'm doing this with uh, static images. A lot of times when I give my talk, there um, are sort of uh, moving images. And and uh, so I, I think um, it really probably won't detract uh, um, at all from the, uh, the talk. So uh, thanks again, and I'm gonna get started. Um, and so what I'd like to do is kind of get immediately into a specific clinical scenario. And uh, this is to, um, demonstrate um, how one might be able to utilize um, big data and uh, um, deep learning and also um, artificial intelligence type applications to help patients out specifically in radiology. A lot of the um, work and research I'm doing recently is on combining computer science um, with uh, medical applications. And I believe that high-speed computing and really on the big data sets that we're um, becoming, um, that are now becoming accessible is gonna completely change the way that we practice radiology and the way that we uh, practice medicine too. And uh, so um, I'd like to start with an example and uh, we can sort of take that example and um, generalize it too. And we're gonna, um, I'm, I'd like to introduce you to He's a 62-year-old native Hawaiian smoker with a COPD, and he's referred to, uh, for a screening study because of his age and smoking history. And so when he gets his um, screening CT scan, uh, he's found to have a seven millimeter spiculated soft tissue density in the uh, left lower lobe. And so Mr. Akamai, of course, is really concerned. And one of the questions he asks is, what is the likelihood that it's malignant? And you know how should the nodule be uh, be followed up? And so, um, as your next door neighbor, he poses the question to you, or, or as your patient, he poses the question to you. And is there anybody, or can any of us really um, tell him what are the odds that this nodule that's been identified on the screening study is malignant 
and give him advice about what to do. And so um, the first thing that would occur to most people would be to take a look at um, some of the literature and some of the specific recommendations that have been made. And so um, what you see on this slide are, is the Lung RADS version one assessment. Um, this is from uh, April of 2014. And um, with Lung RADS, um, he would have been put into um, this category three, which is uh, probably benign with a solid nodule uh, uh, somewhere between um, six and eight millimeters at, um, at baseline. And so if you take a look at the management, the management recommendation would be to get a low dose CT follow-up in six months with a probability of malignancy of one to 2%. And an estimated prevalence of this finding, according to um, lung rads, of about 5%. But Mr. And he might ask you whether if you had a seven millimeter lesion, whether you would feel comfortable waiting that six months for a low dose CT also. And he questions whether the probability of malignancy with lung rads really applies to him because he is a um, heavy smoker. He has a strong family history of lung cancer. He's a Pacific Islander and that ethnicity has increased risk of um, lung cancer. And so the, the question is, to what extent, if we tailor the um, management and also diagnosis um, based on him and his lung nodule, can we really um, add to his care and his information? And um, can we utilize um, computers and all the tools that are now accessible to us in 2016 and the databases that are becoming accessible to be able to treat him? And can we then generalize that to um, all of the ways that we treat patients in radiology and in medicine in general? Um, we could also look at the uh, Fleischner Society guidelines, which some people might mention as well, but they're really not appropriate for a screening study. But if this were picked up incidentally and he was having the uh, CT scan of the chest or even abdomen um, that included that nodule for some other reason, then he would fall into this between six and eight millimeter range in Fleischner um, criteria. And then he would um, essentially be told pretty much similarly to get a follow-up CT at um, three to six months. So, you know, in this case, um, you might tell him that based on the ACR lung rad guidelines, that there should be a follow-up um, examination in six months. And then the question is, how do you respond to him Is there any guidance that helps out with that? And so um, the question is, what are the keys to being able to answer his question about having lung cancer? Well, with low dose screening CT, the um, screening CT scan does represent a biomarker for detection of the lung nodule. So the questions in order to determine whether we can help um, Mr. Akamai out are, do we have the informatics infrastructure to allow us to reliably acquire, measure, archive, and analyze the data? Do we have the computational power? If we had a database with tens of thousands of patients or millions of patients, is the computer power there? How reliable are the measurements that we um, could make? And then can we practically incorporate these sorts of um, decision tools into routine workflow? So we're talking about lung nodules, but really, questions or decisions in radiology that might involve personalizing a case or a decision to a particular patient really have very wide applicability, um, way beyond just chest CT and lung nodules, of course. And so, you know, some of the questions are, what characteristics can we describe about this nodule? Shape, density, location, um, size, for example. Um, is there an estimate of error on the, uh, on the measurement? Do we have databases that we can use as a reference? If this is our next door neighbor, what database would we refer this to? Would this be our own mental database of patients that we've treated um, with seven millimeter nodules or are there other databases available? And then, you know, the last question is, can we personalize the recommendations for Mr. Akamai? Can we essentially um, 
look at the nodule and can we also take information about Mr. Akamai that we have and create a pretest probability? And I'd like to just go over briefly the uh, top seven informatics challenges to, um, to medical imaging that I see and that um, were sort of based on work I did within the National Cancer Institute at the uh, National Institutes of uh, Health in the US. And so one of the challenges that we have is lack of acquisition standards. And so if Mr. Akamai got his CT scan on um, one particular scanner, how likely is it that um, the nodule would have been seen as the same size and shape on other scanners. And so, you know, one thing that's really important is the whole idea of um, creating uniform protocols for acquisition, whether it's PET scanning, whether it's MR, ultrasound, CT. And so there is um, a protocol called UPIC, Uniform Protocols in Clinical Trials, that are used for clinical trials. I strongly believe that they should also be utilized for routine clinical care um, for example, for a chest CT screening, cutting across um, multiple different types of CT scanners and tailored for each scanner. The other question is, is there a radiology lexicon? If we're going to be doing database lookups, is there a way to be able to uniformly describe size, make measurements? Is there a way to describe shape, location, et cetera? And so the RSNA's RADLEX project um, which I would love to see, um, you know, more general adoption throughout the world, essentially addresses many of the uh, challenges of a lexicon to uh, describe findings. The next challenge is difficulty quantifying lesion size and change over time. Um, and that's something that you're all familiar with. The KIBA effort, the Quantitative Image Biomarkers Alliance, led by Daniel Sullivan, has attempted to tackle this challenge for CT and for What's the likelihood that that measurement will um, be the same if I measure the patient again? Sort of the classic coffee ba um, break experiment where if a patient gets scanned and then comes back again in um, a half an hour, will I get the same measurement? The other really important point is that in general, we don't have the concept as do other sciences of error of measurement in radiology. If I say that the lesion is seven millimeters, does that mean seven millimeters plus or minus a half a millimeter, plus or minus one or two millimeters? And so in a lot of cases, the decisions that we make based on recommendations um, may actually boil down to number one, whether or not um, we perceive um, that the measurement is correct and, and how accurate it is. Number two, if there's a change, how much of a change is actually significant? And if we're following a lesion over time, what's the minimum amount of time that we can re-image the patient? And if we see a change, feel confident that that change is actually a biologic change, not just a change in measurement. So it would be really great to see vendors starting to think of the concept of error of measurement um, in these measurements that are made. Um, the next one is lack of adoption of annotation and markup standards. So right now we can make measurements on our PAX workstations or on our um, advanced visualization or quantitative workstations, but most of these measurements are currently stored in proprietary format. And so if I go to your facility or I, I go to um, other uh, facilities, the um, images themselves are associated with measurements and annotations that are proprietary to a particular brand of workstation or, or, or um, advanced visualization. standard called AIM, annotation, annotation and Markup Standard, which uses XML or, or can utilize DICOM SR to be able to um, represent in a uniform way measurements that are made. And it would be great to see more general adoption of this um, lingua franca that would cut across multiple different um, types of uh, workstations and systems. The next one is the difficulty with multiple different um, software and interpretation platforms. So, you know, if I make a measurement on my workstation, you may get a different um, uh, diameter or 
volumetric measurement on your workstation. And so there really needs to be the capability of being able to have uniform methods that cut across different vendors for, uh, for making measurements. The uh, um, next um, informatics challenge is the lack of standardized reference image sets. And so both NCI with the TCIA, the Cancer Image um, Archive, and the RSNA's uh, Kiba Archive and others attempt to address this by having standardized reference tests. And the Kiba effort tries to do the same thing so that we can help determine the um, error of measurement or variability in uh, measurements that we make. And really the last standard and the last challenge, and this is something I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, is just related to promoting sharing of images. And so although there are um, clearly um, tens or hundreds of millions of CT scans that have been performed over the last many years, uh, many of which are thoracic CTs, many of which have nodules associated with them, we really don't have any mechanism to search through those databases. And arguably we don't even have We'll talk about that. So, you know, really to a large extent, unfortunately, we're still practicing in an anecdotal, non-data-driven, you know, what I might characterize as the Flintstone era of measurement, of, of medicine, where we really don't have um, easy access, even if we um, have access to the, um, the data, um, uh, even if we have access to computational resources, we don't necessarily have access to um, the um, data sets. And so much of what we decide for patients such as Mr. Akamai is anecdotal and uh, non-data driven. I'm getting a message about checking my microphone because you're missing the voice. Every once in a while, I, I get an interruption um, that um, asks, that says that my microphone is not muted. And so I'll try to stop talking over, over that. That may be part of it. So one question is, do we have the computational power to help out Mr. Akamai? And as many of you remember, 2011 may be remembered as the year of reemergence of quote unquote artificial intelligence in medicine. The Jeopardy match played by the IBM team and the emergence of Siri really started sparking our imagination about the potential of very um, massive computational resources such as was used for the uh, um, IBM Jeopardy match. One question is how reliable is our human um, judgment in the uh, likelihood of disease? Well, here's an example that I, that I um, show and teach our, our residents and medical students um, with regard to Bayesian reasoning. And so um, imagine a brand new extraordinarily highly Sensitivity is a truly impressive 98%. And um, the specificity of this hypothetical test for Ebola is even higher. So the specificity is a remarkable 99%. So if the subject does not have Ebola, the test comes back negative 99% of the time, let's say. So say at the airport in Liberia, 10 in every 50,000 people that fly have Ebola at any given time. We have a test that's 98% sensitive 99% specific. So if your best friend gives you a call and says that he just tested positive for Ebola, what's the likelihood that he actually has Ebola with a, nine, a test that has 98% sensitivity, 99% specificity, where 10 out of every 50,000 people that fly have Ebola at any given time? So when I ask the residents and the medical students, I ask them, well, is it greater than 99%? Um, is it 98%? Is it um, around 50% only or 8.6% or is it actually less than 2%? And most of the residents um, will guess somewhere around 50% or in the 90%. But actually, as uh, many of you who are familiar with Bayes' um, theorem um, know, is that actually the probability is less than 2%. And the reason is that the 8 priori likelihood of disease is so small. There were only 10 people 
out of um, 50,000 um, that were positive. And so if the specificity of the test is 99%, that means out of 50,000, 500 are going to um, test positive um, falsely. And so you've got um, only 10 people with the disease. So anyone who's told that they're positive um, actually is very unlikely to have Ebola, despite the very high sensitivity and specificity. And the reason I, I give that example is that we humans are not the best at um, thinking in Bayesian terms, as the medical students and, and residents often demonstrate. And the other point is that the Bayesian a priori probability for somebody like Mr. Akamai is really um, important to determine, and it's something that most of us ignore. Can we use computers to extract data from um, images? Can the computers actually be used to recognize lung nodules? Well, in my experience, the answer is increasingly yes, they're doing a really good job. You may rec um, recognize the uh, 1950 paper by Alan Turing that asked about artificial intelligence and when will a um, computer actually be, quote unquote, able to think. And the Turing test um, criteria was whether or not you could fool a human being into thinking that a computer was actually a, a person. So if you have um, a computer in the next room or person in the next room and you're texting with um, that entity, can a computer fool you into thinking it's human? And Turing suggested that Computer machines can be thought of as thinking once they pass that test. But actually, that turns out to be not that difficult of a test to fool a human into thinking that a computer is another human. And there are yearly contests. And last year's contest actually had a fairly convincing capability of one of the programs that simulated a, a young Russian adolescent um, and fooled the judges where they couldn't be sure whether it was a human or a person. And also the um, emergence of Siri suggested an alternative test. And that is something like this Highlights Magazine um, image where um, kids who are four, five, six, seven years old are asked what's wrong with this picture. And actually there's no computer that exists today that can beat a four, five or six year old in um, determining what's wrong with this picture. Um, and so, you know, it's a really incredibly in, um, difficult a challenge to be able to extract information from uh, medical images. And so um, it's a it's an really um, very interesting field and there are tremendous developments that are being made, but still computers are way behind humans in doing that. And so overall, I think for radiology, um, the state of the art is that computers um, are currently able to do other tasks in medicine still significantly better than, um, than being able to recognize uh, images, but they're getting better. So how about Watson's deep QA software for Mr. Akamai? Could Watson um, be able to uh, answer the question for Mr. Wak uh, Akamai's lung nodule? Well, even though imaging may be a, a um, um, future frontier, um, the um, software could look through very large databases and be able to try and um, determine whether or not that nodule was positive. The problem though, is that those databases really are not available or accessible to um, those sorts of um, high performance computing systems. Um, one other question is, can we use um, highly structured tags to be able to label images? And we'll talk about that. So, um, We have access to a, a corporate data um, warehouse of over 32 million patients. Um, we also are in the process of being able to interface with the United Kingdom CPRD database to be able to extract data also. And there are incredible gold mines of clinical and research data from clinical trials that could be accessible, but currently are not accessible to systems like uh, Watson.
And so if I have a patient with a pediatric brain tumor um, and I'm talking with that patient's parents and uh, they ask me a question about treating the patient, I would love to be able to access the database from the NIH um, Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program uh, Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. The problem is, is that if I want to access the database to take care of this young child that's um, sitting in front of me, the mechanism that I have to access that clinical trial database is I have to send away my CV, um, a description of my research project, talk about affiliated research institutions. Um, and I don't want to have to send my CV and wait a number of weeks to have a committee determine whether I can have access to the data. I want to be able to look something up for that patient who's sitting in front of me right now. And so the model that we have um, in the U.S. at least for um, clinical trial data, where even after the data are published, they're not really accessible, or if they are, you have to go through a number of different hoops or a specific portal. I want to be able to make those data indexed and available for real-time decision support for patients such as this one with a pediatric brain tumor or um, patients like Mr. Akamai. That doesn't exist currently. And so, it, and there's not even an index of So if we go back to Mr. Akamai with the seven millimeter speculated uh, left lower lobe nodule, and we want to try to figure out um, what we can do and use informatics tools, one tool that we have is uh, the um, American College of Radiology um, tool that allows us to at least look at um, lung rads criteria. So there's a tool called ACR Assist that while I as the radiologist am reading out a CT scan, say on Mr. Akamai, at least it will show me the ACR's um, lung rads criteria. So at least I don't have to open up a, a book or textbook or go online to look it up. At least it's available at the time that I'm dictating. And that's a great start from an informatics perspective. But what I want is so much more. Here's a, a lung rads app by Chris Wald um, developed. And again, it makes it easier for me to apply lung rads, but still lung rads is not personalized to Mr. Akamai. It still has kind of a one size fits all set of recommendations. And what I really want to be able to do is personalize my observations. And so this is a workstation that was developed as part of the uh, work that um, I helped to fund when I was at the National Cancer Institute, where we had a template for um, evaluating um, glioblastoma multiforme tumors. And so this template would guide the radiologist through multiple different um, questions and then take the data and use it to cross-correlate with genomic, clinical, um, MR, and other data and would allow us to create a personalized, that is for that specific patient's genomic data, medical imaging data, clinical and lab data, a personalized Kaplan-Meier survival plot and also um, To help out Mr. Akamai. And so um, can we essentially use information from the National Lung Screening Trial data to be able to help out Mr. Akamai and be able to do that real time? And so we did a study looking at um, utilizing the National Lung Screening Trial data, which as you recall, was done to look at whether or not um, screening chest CT had a significant advantage over screening chest radiography um, and of course, it was a question about screening in general, and it suggested that screening CT um, did decrease the uh, rate of mortality um, associated with uh, lung cancer. But as part of that study, we have tens of thousands of CT scans that were performed for uh, screening patients um, with a very large number of nodules and, and really excellent follow-up on those patients. And so there were 27,000 participants, approximately 32,000 nodules that were identified. And so wouldn't it be fantastic um, to be able to um, have a resource where one could actually go through that entire database for a patient? So um, my laboratory um, got permission from NIH to download the entire National Lung Screening Trial data set to the cloud. 
And then we developed a series of tools. Here's one of them that allows us to be able to either manually put in the patient gender, smoking history, um, margins, opacity, lobe location, and other um, variables, and then be able to do an instantaneous query to determine for patients who have nodules like a particular type of nodule of a particular size and a particular sex in particular location, what the actual probability of um, For males 60 to 65 that were five to seven millimeters were malignant. And so what we can do is we can um, essentially look back to Mr. Akamai, who's a category three, suggesting a one to 2% probability of malignancy. But when we look at the location of the lesion, the fact that it's spiculated and his smoking history, actually his likelihood of having lung cancer is much greater, closer to 12 to uh, 15%. And so here, spiculated lesions, in the National Lung Screening Trial were significantly greater um, risk of malignancy, as you would intuitively think. And so what we found was that if we just look at the category two, three, four, A and four B lung rads categories and likelihood of malignancy from the National Lung Screening Trial, you can see, as you would have imagined, as the categories go up, the likelihood of malignancy goes up. That's completely intuitive. And we can document that based on our data analysis. However, what we found is that when we personalized it, as we did for Mr. Akamai, taking into account the location of the lesion, whether it was speculated and other data, um, using all the information that we had on the patient, actually it ended up reclassifying patients into different categories of follow-up. So we found a significant percentage of patients were reclassified from a six-month follow-up to um, either a shorter or a longer follow-up. And so we found a high percentage of the patients, as you can see here, um, using the personalized criteria, we saw a discrepancy between um, the percentage of patients it would put into different follow-up categories in comparison to just using lung rads without enhancing it with a additional personalized information. And so knowing all that information that we know and is add the nodule shape um, to the equation. And so we could then take a nodule and then look through the entire National Lung Screening Trial for all nodules that were similar to the one that was seen in our patient, say Mr. Akamai, and then add that um, nodule matching to our algorithm to determine the likelihood of, um, of malignancy for his lesion. And so we used a, a large number of different variables looking at the pixels of the nodule themselves. Actually, um, there could be hundreds of different variables that one might use for a, a machine learning algorithm for that. The other question, given our discussion about pretest probability and Bayesian analysis, is what if we could determine the likelihood that a patient is going to develop cancer in the next five to six years in our equation? And so we downloaded another data set that was made available called PLCO, the prostate lung cancer, uh, the prostate cancer, lung cancer, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial that followed 155,000 patients over a period of approximately um, 15 years. And so we're able to, for example, see for lung cancer that patients who are um, Pacific Islanders like Mr. Akamai have a six-fold approximately greater chance of developing lung cancer in the next six years in comparison to um, a, a Hispanic patient, for example. And so knowing ethnicity and knowing family history and other information allows us to be able to significantly improve our ability to um, determine um, the likelihood of malignancy and what follow-up we should be doing. So. from the PLCO study and be able to combine those so we could create a cohort of patients of those 155,000. So for example, we could look at patients who are taking ibuprofen or patients who are smoking different amounts or um, 
any amount of information, including family history, put that into the equation and get an instantaneous response as far as lung cancer likelihood and mortality likelihood in the next uh, uh, N number of years. And so when we ran the participants who would have qualified for the NLST study by age and by smoking criteria, what we find is that there's an approximately eight-fold increased risk of developing lung cancer in those patients. But we can tailor the likelihood of lung cancer specific to a patient like Mr. Akamai, for example. We could also use this tool that, looks at the, that looked at the 155,000 patients for risk of 40 different types of cancers and determine who would be best to screen rather than just sort of blindly or, or semi-blindly screening everyone above a certain age with a smoking history, you could take all patients that based on their personal criteria might qualify for an increased likelihood of developing cancer and screen those patients. And so by combining the a priori probability based on the patient characteristics with the findings in the um, CT scan, one has a very powerful combination tool. The tools that I'm talking about were using the National Lung Screening Trial data, which collected data across the U.S., but certainly other cohorts and populations, such as the VA population and patients, or um, perhaps a European patient population in comparison with an Asian population, um, or... being able to reproduce what we did from a national set of databases and be able to use your own local database would allow you to be able to tailor your own calculations and your own recommendations based on um, your own population. Uh, we'd also like to see this sort of data incorporated into CAD software. Currently, CAD software is really pretty dumb. It doesn't um, uh, take into account prior examinations. It doesn't take into account a priori probability of a patient developing disease. And it really doesn't use some of these really large databases that are accessible for the CAD software. And I think the CAD software could be improved considerably. So in conclusion, um, I think we already have all the pieces that we need to help somebody like Mr. Akamai and his physician stay informed. What we want to be able to do is let um, Mr. Akamai and his physician know that there might be a 15 to 20% chance of malignancy of that seven millimeter spiculated nodule specifically in Mr. Akamai with different probabilities um, for other seven millimeter lesions in other patients. And so it would be great to be able to allow Mr. Akamai and his physician to make their own decision about follow-up based on um, as accurate an estimate of what the probabilities are as possible rather than one size fits all. And so radiology's biomarkers, such as in our example of the lung cancer and lung cancer screening with CT, um, can be thought of as radiomics, analogous to genomics. And we can make these data available for decision support. Um, just parenthetically, it would be fantastic to have also had genomic data as part of the National Lung Screening Trial, but it wasn't. But at your own institutions, and in the future, I believe that we'll have that genomic and proteomic to a new generation in which we practice medicine, not anecdotally, but we're able to use super high-speed computers and combine those with databases that we have that are local, regional, national, international, that allow us to be able to tailor our decisions specific to specific patients, given that patients were seen in our study and many others to vary tremendously according to their own family history and according to their own risk factors. And I think that's going to very significantly change the way that we practice radiology and we practice medicine in the future. I think one of the main missing components is this culture of sharing that's really important to be able to have access to these databases. Currently, um, the NIH and other databases are only accessible with proper permission and in many cases require one to, to essentially publish data. Um, and so um, it's really, um, I think, going to take a significant cultural change to be able to make um, these data available more generally.
I think we owe it to patients like Mr. Akamai and millions of other patients around the world to change our culture and take advantage of the incredible advances that we have in 2016 in deep learning, machine learning, and high-performance computing. And I think that's something that um, we can explore uh, at meetings in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much for attending mm -hmm. the, uh, the webinar, and, and I'd be delighted to, uh, to address any, um, any questions. Okay. Many thanks, uh, Elliot, for uh, your uh, very, very interesting uh, webinar about uh, the uh, combining uh, population and patient-specific data to inform personalized This is amazing. Uh, are there any questions for uh, Elliot? Oh, okay. So, uh, Elliot, uh, there are questions coming from you, already prepared probably by the attendees. So the first one is uh, from Eric Rancher. Do you see liquid biopsies as a competitor for medical imaging and decision support software, especially for screening purposes? Yeah, so um, I see it as a competitor for medical imaging, meaning that I think liquid biopsies, um, even though some of the evidence has been on relatively smaller numbers of patients, uh, these liquid biopsies sound incredibly promising. And, and as we get more experience with these liquid biopsies looking for, you know, really incredibly small um, amounts of, uh, of DNA um, that, or RNA that can be analyzed, um, the um, initial preliminary results have been incredibly promising. So although it might be a competitor for medical imaging, I really see it as much more synergistic and, and much more additive to medical imaging. And so I would see um, screening at some point um, for using these liquid biopsies for a variety of different cancers, having something come back suspicious for lung cancer or colorectal cancer, or maybe even just adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma in general, and then having that essentially trigger diagnostic studies to um, find the lesion, potentially biopsy the lesion, because as you know, the DNA of these lesions can uh, change um, over a relatively short period of time. So I see the liquid biopsies working hand in hand very much with the uh, medical imaging procedures. And I actually see an increase associated with these liquid biopsies in medical imaging, uh, in screening, but also in directed um, studies um, after these liquid biopsy studies. The other <clears throat> And other information will be one more source of fantastic data for us. And so as we help out Mr. Akamai, being able to um, have learned the results of his liquid biopsy, in addition to all the data that we had, and maybe his genomic profile would have added tremendously to our likelihood of disease. And so perhaps with the liquid biopsy, we might have been 70% sure that um, Mr. Akamai either had or, or didn't have um, uh, cancer, for example, or, or um, so I think that the liquid biopsy will be one more series of data that we have in order to determine what is the next best step. So thanks for the question. I think liquid biopsies yeah. are going to be really exciting, and I see them as much more complementary than um, as a competitor to medical imaging. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Yes, uh, before I made a mistake, because I uh, um, said that the title of the webinar was Lung Nodules Combined Population and Patient Specific Data, etc. But this was the title of your presentation during the SRNA. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm right, yeah? <laughs> yes, so exactly. I, I, I was there, I was there, so I was impressed by this, so that it was still in my mind. Uh, uh -huh. there, is another, <laughs> there is another question from uh, Salvatore Sgroi from Verona. Yes. Uh, the question, you know, is there any chance all those tools will be organized in just one website and or source easy to access for all of us in our day by day practice? That's a fantastic question. And I have to um, talk about a, an irony of, of all of this presentation, which is really part of the theme of my talk. And that is I, I've given this talk on a number of occasions and um, I've had physicians come up and tell me that they have a family member who's incidentally been found to have a lung nodule or they have had a lung
The problem that I have with my current permission from the National Institutes of Health is I have permission to do research and write papers on what would happen if I had a website, which is functional now, um, and that we can demonstrate and show what would be the implications for research purposes and for the practice of medicine. But I don't actually have the ability to be able to share permission yet, although I'm trying to get it, to be able to share the data from the website. So I'd love to share the National Lung Screening Trial Tool because it's a fantastic tool. I'd love to be able to share the PLCO um, tool because being able to type in a combination of data is fascinating. Being able to just type in something like ibuprofen and see for 40 cancers, you know, what is the um, impact of using ibuprofen um, and get that answer back in five seconds is a fascinating way to do research and practice clinical medicine. The irony is, is that um, NIH still has a culture where they fear that um, having these tools that would get out to the public or would get out in general might be misused and might, you know, there might be confusion about cause and effect and people might not use them properly. My feeling is they should be transparent. You know, the uh, PLCO database and the NLST each, uh, from my understanding, costs somewhere upwards of 200 to 250 million dollars. So you're talking about, you know, approaching a third to a quarter of a billion dollars of public funds that were spent. The papers are fantastic, but I'd love to see the data transparently shared. And so, you know, part of my kind of mission and quest as I see it is to try to get permission to be able to make these tools generally accessible. And then in addition to just a website, to click on a, a nodule and be able to get recommendations, get likelihood of malignancy and be able to, you know, um, see the source of the information. So that's a long winded way of saying, unfortunately, I don't have the capability or permission to be able to share it. Once I do, I'd be delighted to put this up in a website and make that website have an API or a REST interface that would allow other systems to be able to utilize it as a resource. So thanks for the question. Uh, uh, one source of information like, uh, I mean, uh, repositories available on web uh, could be the imaging biobanks. Uh, and you know, Elliot, that in Europe, we have done a survey within the European Society of Radiology checking the existence of such repositories. And we found that uh, there, are, there are a lot of repositories uh, that we can call imaging biobanks, but these are not uh, uh, accessible on the web. They are restricted to clinical trials or internal hospital, uh, I mean, uh, university. So uh, we have the, exactly the same, the same problem. Yes, uh, and the, even if they were accessible um, via portals, like, for example, the Alzheimer's uh, ADNI mm -hmm. database, and there's other databases, when we access them, we don't want to necessarily have to sign into 100 portals as a radiologist as we read during the day. What would be great would be to be able to have automated access. So, you know, whether you're talking about yes. um, any AI type of system, being able to have that system that you use access the database freely um, without your having to go and sign on to many different portals. And then uh, I think the final um, important step is how do we get this, even once we have universal access to it, if we ever do, an easy way to index and search. How will we incorporate the <clears throat> about having the capability of being able to click on a nodule and get the answer? And I should emphasize that even though I used lung nodules as my example case, lung nodules really are one of an infinite number of applications um, in radiology. You could imagine this for all sorts of different um, disease processes. And it would be fantastic for the people who were you know, on the webinar or listening later or others to be inspired to try to figure out how can we translate these gold mines of resources into something that we can all use to help out our patients. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is a, another question. I think that could be the, the final question of the we webinar. Uh, from Eric Ranschert, uh, 
uh, do you see a shift? This is about reporting, which is very important also for the kind of uh, interactivity we can, have, we can have with the repositories. Do you see a shift towards multimedia reporting, including all kinds of different data, findings, risk, prognosis? Interesting. Yeah, so that's a great softball question. And I really appreciate it, Eric, to essentially um, my pointing out that absolutely, I, I do see a shift toward multimedia reporting. And not just multimedia reporting, including potentially genomic heat maps and um, reporting that would include results from liquid biopsies and imaging studies and others, but also being able to use the computer interactively. I, I, I've had the privilege to continue working with IBM and a number of other vendors looking at how can we make these tools useful to radiologists and useful to referring clinicians. So, you know, those of you who've worked with a spreadsheet where you can change the data, pivot on the information, ask different questions, ask different what ifs, um, you know, is exactly the direction that I'd like to be able to uh, head in. And so um, having radiologists be able to Um, in an interactive way. And so I see step one being the uh, multimedia reporting and step two being kind of like a artificial intelligence program. And many of us, including myself, make fun of Siri and all the mistakes that Siri and the so-called AI mm -hmm. programs end up making. And we have, you know, make a lot of fun of the um, uh, speech recognition systems, but they're getting smarter and smarter all the time. There are huge resources, you know, um, uh, Google recently uh, beat the European and then subsequently Asian champion at the board game Go. And, you know, it's capturing all of our imaginations. And so I'd like to, I, I am positive we'll see a shift toward multimedia reporting, absolutely. And then the next paradigm shift after that will be interactive, um, intelligent mechanisms of being able to present dashboards and information particular to the patient and ask and answer specific questions for the radiologist and referring clinicians also. So thanks. Okay. So I think the time is over and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Seeger for his availability to give the webinar to the Wisomi Society. And to be honest, we would like to continue to hear you in this webinar and to continue to make questions, but we have to close. The, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having, uh, having uh, uh, given this uh, uh, nice uh, webinar. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all the attendees uh, and to remind that the webinar of, of Professor Seeger will be available on the Usomi YouTube channel uh, within one hour because it's been completely fully recorded. So thank you very much, Elliot, again.